Oh, Todd, I, I feel kind of strange doing an interview because you and I have already traveled a lot of miles together. We uh, certainly have, buddy. Working yeah. on the podcast, yeah. my NASCAR podcast. But I wanted to sit down with you because you do have what I consider to be a pretty extraordinary testimony. All right, thank you for that. Um, you you grew up here in Yakinville? No, actually, um, Forsyth County, Stanleyville, Germington area. Yeah. Um, we moved to Yadkin County. Dad got transferred with Duke Power, 72, 73. So I was uh, 12, 13 years old, moved to Yadkinville from Stanleyville area. Yeah. Uh, so you've you've lived here a little over 50 years? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Uh, uh, are you 50, still Are 50. you still considered a foreigner because you weren't? Uh, I, uh, I call myself an implant. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So you grew up. Um, you you moved here when you were. Yeah, twelve, thirteen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where'd you go to high school? Four Bush. Four Bush. Yeah. Okay. Class of seventy eight, baby. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the one thing that people know at face value about Todd Phillips is that you are really, really big into music. Pretty much, yeah. Where where did that first start? Uh, I mean, were you in the band in high school, or you know, where? no, I never really was. Uh, I never pursued the the, the, the band structure or the, or the chorus. Um, I guess both sides, maybe, but mainly on my mom's side. Uh, when mom was a teenager, she sung on the radio. Uh, down toward Broadway, North Carolina, Sanford Broadway area, sung on the radio, um, and it's a funny story that um, Charlie Daniels also played in the studio with her. Of course, he was just a little little local known guitar player who, uh, you know, mom got married and raised a family, and he went on to uh, to be who he is or was. So your mama. New Charlie Daniels. Yes. No way. Uh, yeah. Um, and there was a local um, funeral director there or owned a funeral parlor there in town that was really, really good friends with Charlie Daniels and helped promote him and get him to where he was. And uh, it's my understanding uh, through stories that Charlie Daniels still would send this man tickets to concerts whenever he was local. So, yeah, yeah. Wow. Little known fact. Yeah, Mama, I guess Mama, if you know, if she had went the, the other direction, I don't know. But I think most of that comes from mom. I can remember as a young child, dad sitting around the house um, behind closed doors uh, playing a flat top guitar. And uh, dad's a lot like me. He doesn't say much. Uh, you have to dig to get stuff out of me, Rick. Um, oh, I will. But yeah, don't, he, don't you know, worry. I will. Uh, I, can remember <laughs> I brought my would, shovel. <laughs> you know, uh, fond memories of him sitting on a chair with a flat top guitar picking and very quietly singing some Johnny Cash and stuff like that. Yeah, the old good country western stuff. So yeah, both sides, but I think mainly probably my mom's side. Um, and I got bit at an early age, probably 12 or 13 years old. Uh, started to learn to play guitar a little bit. Yeah. And just never been able to shake it. You picked it up and never put it picked down. Picked it up, yeah. <laughs> now, what all can you play? I really can't play anything. <laughs> no. Um, my main focus was, well, when I first started, I was playing guitar, um, learning to play guitar. And I was a teenager uh, right into high school, 13, 14 years old, and everybody was playing guitar. And everybody was wanting to, I say everybody, uh, my local friends. And we put a little band together, but we didn't have a bass player. You know, everybody was playing guitar. We Luckily, we had a guy that could beat and bang on some drums. Um, I thought, well, okay, I, I'll, I'll play bass. And um, it just sort of stuck with me throughout the rest of my life. Yeah. But I play, I play, I can bang on some drums. I can play a flat top guitar. Um, I like messing with the harmonica a little bit, um, dabble with a mandolin. I'm not very good on any of it, but I can sit down and fiddle around with it enough to get through some songs and stuff, but, but mainly focus on the bass guitar. Yeah. Okay. Was there a point when you knew you were bit? 
by the bug. Oh, gosh, yeah. Uh, 14, 15 years old, we had us a band together. Uh, you know, and I think back, I don't even remember the name of the band, but some of us had driver's license, and I did not. And we were living here in Yakinville, and uh, we had a, we had a gig in Chiraw, South Carolina. We was you know we was going on the road. You were baby. traveling. We was going on the road. <laughs> we played um, a birthday party. And how old were you? Fourteen, fifteen years old. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. We played a birthday party the night before. It was Donna Leatherman, uh, who has now passed away. <laughs> We played her birthday party, and I think we made thirty-five dollars, and that gave us gas money to get to, to Sherrill, South Carolina. Like I said, some of us didn't have license, so Dad drove, uh, and the ones that didn't have license or whatever rode with him. And yeah, he took us to. Uh, like I said, we was fourteen, fifteen, sixteen years old, and we was in a real live honky tonk whatever you want to call it, dance hall, nightclub. You know, lights, stage, the whole nine. Um, yeah, at 15 years old. Now, was that for the birthday party? No, the uh, birthday party was at Four Bush uh, Fire Department. Okay. And we made the money, the gas money. The next night, we, we took off and went to Sherrill, South Carolina. And and uh, that was the nightclub. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's real. I can remember um, going to Hardy's or somewhere like that bef- before the show. We had already set up and everything. And uh, one of the guys that helped run the bar, he was a he was a big burly fella, had a big long beard, and we were standing in line to get food, and he pulled out a what appeared to be a pocket knife, a switchblade, and flipped it open, and it just you know, fifteen year old me just scared me to death. He started combing it. It was a comb, <laughs> combing his beard. So yeah, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, our first official, I guess, professional paying gig at a club was about fifteen years old. So that was thirty. Just to clarify, the thirty-five dollars. That was not thirty-five dollars each. That was not thirty-five dollars all total. For everybody, yeah, yeah, <laughs> big and, time. And how many people were in the band? Probably four or five. <laughs> yeah, 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 big time. On the road, on tour. Okay, on all tour right. with Todd. How how soon did it take for that to start snowballing into more gigs? It hasn't slowed down yet. How about that? Yeah. There's been a time or two that I, you know, I took breaks here and there, but uh, um, out of high school, you know, we've done the little birthday parties and things like that all through high school. But I, after I graduated high school, I, I, I thought, you know, I thought I was going to be a rock star, really did. And uh, But we went pretty hard right out of high school. We hooked up with two guys that was like 10 years older than us that had, that knew the ropes had played the clubs um john hutchins big john hutchins who i love dearly uh taught me so much and david sheik who has passed away um like i said they had been been on the scene and uh us 16 17 year old there was three of us and then those two and uh, it was thursday friday saturday sunday you know with friday night we was gone saturday night we was gone and it was like that for a long time playing music every weekend as hard as we could go the good and the bad and all of it <sighs> in what kinds of locations some good some real bad um, been behind and I hmm, seen some shootings seen some stabbings um, met a lot of good people um we were known uh, with some of the guys in the Hells Angels. Uh, we played for the president, the local Forsyth County chapter. We played for his wedding. Um, went in behind the the chain link fence to the clubhouse, and uh, so yeah, it, it's uh, we we ran across some rough folk, but never was really to the point where I felt like I was in danger. Uh, been places where I probably, you know, think back now. I'm thinking, you know, what in the world was you thinking? But you know, we was always, we were the main attraction, so we was always protected. Uh, late nights and yeah. How impressionable were you? Meaning, 
What kind of influence did it have on yeah. you? Yeah. Um, it took me down some places I shouldn't have been. Shouldn't have been. That's, that's for sure. You know, uh, uh, I say this loosely. The old saying of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, that's what we did. I'm not not happy about that. Right. Uh, it did make me who I am today. Um, taught me a lot at a very early age. Um, but yeah, it was uh, music itself can be very powerful. Um, it can make you happy and make you sad. Um, if you listen to some movie scores and it's, it's a action scene, it's the type of music in the background that's going to get you pumping. And so yeah, music has got a definitely has an influence on people. Yeah. Now you also went to work at yeah at the jail. At the Department of Corrections at the prison here, yeah, okay. in, here in Yakinville, yeah. I started there when I was 21. I had to have a real job, you know, yeah. Yeah. I can't even begin to imagine what that job was like. Uh, you know, I, Rick, I think back now, like I said, when I started there, it was um, October of 1981, and I had just turned 21. And, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was still just a kid. Uh, and they give a kid uh, keys to a to the prison at 21 years old. And, uh, man, did I have to grow up fast. Uh, about the third day on the job, they give me the keys and put me in the dormitory with 200 and some uh, inmates, convicts, murderers, rapists, drug dealers, stealers. Yeah, I had to, I had to, I had to grow up pretty quick and learn a lot. So between your full-time job, which was tough, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the music on, I guess, the weekends, yeah. how were you able to maintain a, a halfway even keel? Or were you? At, at time. <laughs> you know, I think back, and I think I, I, I thought I was getting by, but uh, you know, I guess I was just not. Get, well, you know, I survived it. Um, working in the in the, in the prison system, I think, made me realize that I'm just a. Uh, you know, by the, but by the grace of God, there I am. You know, um, I think it kept me out of a lot of trouble. Um, and yeah, it was hard. Um, sometimes I did have to work on the weekends, and sometimes I would go in the, into a prison system to where I might have had two hours of sleep. But yeah, not a very smart thing to do. Now that I think back, but I would say that was probably not the best thing yeah. for your safety. Yeah, yeah. I can remember one time, um, and this is just a side note: working in the in the dormitory, and you, you had keys. And one of the keys looked like a, a a key that went to like a Pepsi machine that you could use to open it up with, and I had never been told what it was for. And um, and I'm standing out on the front stoop of the of the dormitory, and I see that key, and then I see a a little box beside the door that key will fit in. Interesting. I put the key in the in the little thing and turned it. And nothing happened. I go back in the dormitory. And next thing I know... Opened I, every door in the place. Well, almost, almost. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the correctional officers was, was everywhere all of a sudden. You okay? You okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm quite all right. Well, come to find out that that key actually on top of the dormitory on the pole was a blue light. i never been told anything about it. Oh, wow. And uh, when I turned that key, it cut that blue light on. It didn't set off an alarm or anything, but it turned that blue light on, and the guy on the front tower sees the blue light, he notifies notifies everybody that there's a situation going on in the dormitory, which there wasn't. It was Todd just sticking the, you know. Yeah, that's just one of those, yeah. I think back on it now, it's sort of, yeah. Is there a a gig, a music gig, that, that stands out to you in that Okay, I'm on top of the world here. Well, you know, I'm, 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 yeah, and you know, 
I'm a true believer that even though at times in my life um, I think God was directing my path even though I wasn't walking with God, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes um, perfect sense. Uh, he was preparing me. Uh, in the 90s, I got hooked up um, playing gospel music, playing in, in a quartet, playing bass guitar, and we'd done some really, really cool gigs. Um, played with a lot of a lot of the big up and coming uh, southern gospel musicians. We was playing in the Charlotte Coliseum, in the round, uh, fifteen twenty thousand people. And um, I look up at one time, and they've got these great big overhead screens, and there's my mug, about two stories tall. And you talking about missing some notes. <laughs> but yeah, that's one of my... And I've actually got a picture of me standing on stage looking out into the Coliseum with thousands and thousands of people. And, you know, that's funny because I spent my entire life thinking I was going to be a rock star. And God put me right in the middle of a Coliseum being a God star, I guess. Yeah. For, for His glory. For His glory. For mm-hmm. not for mine, for His. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it's, 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 some of the best gigs has been been with Jesus. When you were in the dive bars and yeah. doing those kinds of gigs, at the same time, I know your mom and dad were. I mean, they're they're bedrocks over at First Baptist. Mm-hmm. What kinds of conversations did your and and your mama? I would assume has never uh, been shy about expressing her opinion. What what was your mom and dad's take on what you were doing? Mom and dad have always been supportive. Okay, never told me that I that I shouldn't be. They always wanted me to be careful. Um, I found out later on going to church here through uh, uh, Je. Uh, Gene Carroll and J.E. Southern mm-hmm. uh, Byron who was Gene Carroll and J.E.'s son he used to run with us and we would play gigs but later here J.E. would tell me that they would come to the gigs and we didn't know it and they would look through the windows at us and see if we were okay really yeah and I didn't I, we never, I never knew that until J.E. told me that but that's when we were teenagers again you know uh, 18, 19 maybe all into it very early 20s but yeah uh, but they never told me that I couldn't go like I said daddy took us to our first gig um, but I've never been one to I've done some things I shouldn't have done but I've never been one to really push the envelope and you know okay. do bad things again was there a specific point where you felt a sense of coming back home you so know, uh, yeah, I, I was married. Um, I had I had a child, uh, India. She was born in eighty nine. Um, was going to Peace Haven Baptist Church here in Yakinville. Uh Having kids changed my life um, for for the better. Um, in ninety two. Chelsea was born in July of 92 and of um, October of that year is when I give my life to the Lord now like I said I had always I'd always been in church um, New John 316 um, raised in church went to church every Sunday um, even into my adult, adult life um, but never had really committed my life um, As Donald Johnson would say, you had a drug problem. Your mom and daddy drug you to church. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, vacation Bible school, the whole nine. Church camp, always. Um, so I had a firm foundation. Uh, I knew what the gospel was, but I had never dedicated my life to the Lord. Uh, October 4th, 1992, uh, Tim Lee Ministries. I don't know if you've ever heard of Tim Lee. Tremendous uh, Vietnam vet. Uh, he's like Lieutenant Dan. He's got no legs. Uh, paced back and forth in that wheelchair. 
and telling me that God loved me. And, you know, I just come to that if this man with no legs that had been, you know, everything had been stripped from him uh, can go on. Uh, I, you know, I just failed to that, that, that evening, I guess, it, afternoon at 11, 1145 or so, October 4th, 1992 is when I, yeah, put it all behind me. And the Lord went to work on me big time. Um, cigarettes, alcohol, foul mouth. Uh, he went to cutting on me. And, uh, yeah. You, you've heard me talk about my weekend at North Wilkesboro and sleeping in my car and yeah. all that. Yeah, yeah. Todd, that was the same weekend. Well, there you go. God was moving, honey. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I did not know that. I, I, noticed, I, I noticed when when I said that date, you just sort of, I seen a little something come across your eyes there, bud. Yeah. Like coming yeah. forward. Isn't that something? Yeah. God was visiting North Carolina. That day. <laughs> yeah, he was. So after you became a Christian, life was absolutely perfect from there on out. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say that. Yeah, but you know, uh, it gave me purpose, gave me meaning. Uh, like I said, I got hooked up with a with a gospel group, um, and uh, quit going to the clubs, um, playing music for Jesus. Um, good gigs, um, but there again. Um, we're all human. Uh, I see that now. That then, like I said, I was I was still drinking milk. Um, we're all human. Uh, I got me and the musicians got let go uh, in the band. Um, that was along the time that uh, got let go by. I don't want to use the word fired. Okay. But we were no longer needed. Right. Um, that was when the little mini discs, you remember those little mini discs? And the, it was before the, right in between the CDs and the cassettes, yeah, they had yeah. the mini discs. Yeah. A lot of the gospel groups were going to the mini discs and was just pretty much singing the tracks. And uh, the musicians were let go. Uh, that hurt. I, you know, I had, I'd never been fired from a, Secular band, and I hate—I use that word loosely. Fired, but it's what it was. Uh, never been fired from a secular band. That hurt. That hurt bad. Um, it wasn't long before that, after that, that I quit going to Peace Haven. Um, I guess I was hurt more than I thought I was, and uh, started spiraling downhill again. Uh, the one thing leads to another. Um, years on down the road, uh, marriage breaks up. Here I am, uh, 50, I'm 63 now, so 55, 56 years old, something around, I'd have to sit down and figure. Uh, single man again, uh, with nothing. I was upset with God, uh, Still had my faith. Um, wasn't happy with God. Uh, I got into walking and talking with God. Uh, I felt like He wasn't hearing me anymore. Um, things weren't going too good again, and it's pretty much—I hate to say it—but it's because I just turned my back on God. He never turned His back on me, but I did Him. Um, and uh, yeah, things went pretty bad. Um, what what brought you back? Um, went through some pretty rough times. Uh, got really, really down. Real down. Um, I knew I needed a change. I, you know, I, I tried the dating scene. I wasn't much into that. Um, uh, they used to have a music uptown at uh, the Arts Council 
Friday nights, acoustic music. I'd go up there and I'd eat dinner and uh, listen to the music. And uh, she'll probably get mad at me for doing this, but um, I seen a little lady sitting across the across the room over there, and she was. I don't know. She just. I had no idea who she was, but she was. She sure was pretty, and uh, I liked the way she held her fork, and she was eating a salad. And uh, I know it is crazy. You like the way I like the way she held her fork. I, <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, <laughs> I know. That, that's a brand new one on me. I did not know who she was, but I, <laughs> I was familiar with the friend that she was with. And that was the time that uh, Facebook was getting pretty popular and uh, through, uh, I don't want to use the word stalking, but through some searching, <laughs> I, found, I found out who she was. And I had been, I hadn't been dating for a year. I just took, you know, I just had to get myself fixed. I know I'd come to the point where I, I got to fix myself. Um, and it was New Year's. And um, I made a new year's resolution that i'm tired of sitting at home lonely and just practically doing nothing uh so i shot her an instant message and uh, asked her if uh it was okay if i sent her a message and it wasn't and i pick pick at her all the time um it was just a nanosecond she replied yes <laughs> So we started dating a little while, and uh, she went to church here at Maplewood. Now, who is she? Uh, Loretta Bolin. Miss Loretta. Miss Loretta. And it's really, <laughs> um, me and, at the same time, me and her was going through the exact same battles. Um, she was separated, uh, and uh, so we had a, had a lot in common, uh, talked a lot, uh, heart-to-heart talks, um, Dated, and I knew she was going to church here, and uh, I knew that Jimmy was the pastor at the time, and Jimmy was a friend of mine. I had known Jimmy for a few years, and uh, asked her if it was okay if I uh, started going to church with her, and uh, of course she said yes, and uh, rededicated my life to the Lord, and uh, and now we can't get rid of you. Now you can't get rid of me. I did. I did, I did uh, <laughs> I did make a promise to the Lord that uh, if he would allow me, um, being that I had been through all this crazy, crazy musical journey, that I would try in my best way to steer the youth of today that was interested in music down the right path instead of the path that I chose. Not that the path that I chose was wrong, but it wasn't the right one. Um, it could have been easier. It could have been better. But like I said, it made me who I am today. It made me a better person. But I made a promise that I, if I could steer a youth in the right direction, that that's what I would do. And uh, I hope I've done that. I, I feel like I've done that with, with some with some of the youth. Yeah. How do you see that? coming to fruition in the future in in steering kids because you, you do because you're a musician because it's cool to play the bass you do have a certain cool factor okay how can you use that to further that goal of being a good influence on the on the youth I, I'd be like, it, I guess, just sharing my testimony with the youth. Like I said, music is a powerful thing. Um, it can steer you in the wrong direction. There is music out there that will, um, uh, like I said, it'll. Uh, 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 but I, I'm also a true believer. If you give God the avenue, whatever avenue that is, rather it be metal heavy metal which i've never really got into but you know there are some christian heavy metal a lot of people shun on that um but if they can hear scripture in one of those songs which i don't don't hear it but if they can 
um, steer steer the youth in the right. You know, everybody listen to music. Um, just just for the record, what's your favorite kind of music? It's all over the board, isn't it? It's pretty much yeah. I've played from bluegrass to gospel uh, to funk, country, country and western. I love country and western. I'm now currently playing in a rockabilly band. Um, got hooked up with a young guy a few years ago, uh, and he's been he helped me in my lost journey there when I was out wandering around in the wilderness. Uh, Taylor Vaden, who was probably praying for me when I couldn't pray for myself, and I didn't know it. But uh, me and him met at the uh, place there in town at the Arts Council. I was playing in a bluegrass band, um, and he came to hear me. And after the show, he pulled me to the side and said he was wanting to put together a rockabilly Elvis, a 1950s when Elvis was on the Sun Record labels. And we did that, and are still doing that. Um, and next year will be our tenth year. And um, I also play in a, another rockabilly band um, that does um, we call the Kings, and we do all the 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 Kings of rock and roll when it first become uh, known as rock and roll. Um, Buddy Holly, um, Richie Valens, Ricky Nelson, all the old kings of rock and roll that got that rockabilly sound started we're doing that um and i say that to say that i try to look at it as a ministry uh as crazy as that may sound uh we do play some clubs um on my upright bass i do have the in great big bold letter psalm 33 3 uh sing unto him a new song play skillfully with a loud noise i have had people come up to me and say what does that what what does that represent and i just tell them go home and google it go google it read it for yourself and you know it's crazy that may sound i feel like i am out there in in the trenches uh that's why i look at it and with that with that statement i think it people ask questions i pray that that happens anyway and I do pray for my gigs different different scenario now you are a part of the the praise team here you're a big part yes. of the praise yes. team here where would you like to see that go in the next five years how, me? how is that a tool that can be used me uh, it's a tremendous tool like I said uh, music uh, is a tremendous avenue for me i would like to see me sit down and maybe one of the youth that i have reached out to take my place and carry on that torch that is that is my actually my my goal is to finally reach someone that is ready to take my take my place oh that would be so fulfilling yeah man you'll never sit down playing music you Probably better not. Won't. Probably won't. Yeah. Better not. Probably won't. <laughs> yeah. If you're looking for a church home, or if you want to be part of a family, if you're looking for a place to go, if you're looking for a place to worship, if you have questions about your faith, if you'd like to talk to somebody about being a Christian, come see us at Maplewood.